It's a good reminder that as we are consumed at times by the uh, horror and the evil of Putin and his war against the Ukrainians, that at the same time you see heroic people making incredible sacrifices for kindness and love and compassion. And even in the ugliness of war, still love and beauty wins the day, and it will ultimately. And that song just kind of helped me to remember that. Today I will be preaching from my paper copy because I can't get my sermon to download onto my tablet. That's why I print the paper copy. So <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I really ever have to use it? Today I do. So <laughs> I see if I can go back to old school okay. All right. Today's scripture lesson is the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. Hear this good news. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go tell that fox. I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow and the third day. I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, how often have I longed to gather you, gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I promise you, Every mother in this room, every mother in this room has had a prophetic voice at some point while you were raising your children. Don't touch the stove. Sweetie, don't touch the stove. It's hot. It'll burn you. It'll hurt you. Sweetie, don't touch the stove. Mama turns around. What happens? Baby touches the stove, baby gets burned, baby cries, right? That prophetic voice was trying to tell that child, don't touch the stove because when you get burned, it hurts. Getting burned hurts. So there's always a prophetic voice in our life at some point, usually at the very beginning. People who have lived life long enough can kind of see where we're going, and they tell us, yeah, if you keep going that way, it's going to be bad. Why don't we listen? I don't know, there just seems to be that part of our human nature that even though it's going to harm us, we've still got to put our finger on the hot stove. God provides prophetic voices around us all the time throughout our whole lives. And when we don't listen to the prophetic voice, does God punish us? I say no. God does not punish us. Just like when you don't punish your child for touching the hot stove, they've had punishment enough. God's not codependent, all right? God does not need us to do everything God says in order for God to feel good about God's self. God has no need to control. And some of you may say, wait a minute. I thought God controlled everything. No, God does not need to control. God lives outside of time and space. God's spirit is eternal. God already sees it all unfolding before any of us are even conscious of it. God doesn't need to control you. And I think Jesus described God beautifully in the story of the prodigal son. Do you remember that story? A uh, loving father has two sons. And one of the sons said, Dad, you're dead to me. Give me my inheritance. I want to go off in the world and, and experience all that life has to give. And to the shock of all of his neighbors, he did. He gave him his inheritance. And his son went off and he lived big. He lived extravagantly. And then finally he was in a foreign land which had a horrible famine. And then that son found himself working on a pig farm. And when he decided... When it came to the point in his life where he was jealous of the food the pigs were eating, the story says he came to himself. And so he started heading back home. He said, it's better for me to be a servant in my father's house than to live here like this. 
So as he was practicing his speech all the way there, Father, I have sinned against you and against God. I pray that you would just take me in. As, a, as he was practicing it all the way there, Daddy was already on the front porch looking and waiting. When he saw him coming in a distance, he ran to greet him and immediately hugged him. And before his fun, son could finish the speech that he had practiced for all the way, he ordered put a ring on his finger, a cape on his back, and shoes on his feet, kill the fatted calf for having a party. My son, who was lost, has now become home. And while the party was going, he had another son who was extremely obedient, obedient to a fault. In fact, he was so obedient, there was no joy in his obedience. And when he saw his brother was having a party, and he who had been obedient to his father his whole life, he got mad. But his father says, oh my goodness, you, everything I have is yours. Everything I have is yours. Come, your brother who was dead is now alive. And come and join the party. And he wouldn't do it. The constant between those two extremes is this. The loving father loved anyway. So when we listen, when we don't listen, God is not here to punish us. God lets us live and learn from our mistakes. Because when we make a mistake and it burns, hopefully we choose not to do it again. You know, we often think of prophets as these supernatural seers, right? They're able to kind of predict the future. It's almost like they're using a crystal ball. But in the classic form of prophecy, that's not the case. The classic Hebrew prophet was so in tune to today, to the moment, that the prophet was able to see if we continue on this path, this is the destructive results down the road. Global warming, which Bob mentioned earlier today, has been prophesied now for over 20 years. I remember in 2000, Al Gore did a movie about it, right? And became the, the source for many as a, of a joke. We've been getting the warnings now for 20 years. And it's only now that we had a hurricane season where we went through the whole English alphabet and then some of the Greek alphabet. Maybe we're now getting some attention. Tornadoes and storms and weather patterns are more severe and intense than they ever were. Glaciers are melting and the water levels and the sea levels. Okay. Oh, okay. Now let's get serious because it seems to be happening. Prophetic voices are always there for us to listen to. During 2020 and shelter in place, we weren't driving, planes weren't flying, buses weren't traveling, trains weren't going, and there was a huge glut of oil in the world, right? And we saw oil prices dip down really low. And then oil producing nations decided that they would produce less to inflate the prices of oil, right? I remember when that happened during the Carter administration, I think it was made in 1978, when OPEC got together and decided to do the same thing. I, do any of you remember spending 30 to 40 cents a gallon for gas? I could fill my car up for $5. It shot up to a dollar, I thought the world had come to an end. When it shot up to a dollar fifty, I thought I will never be able to have anything for the rest of my life. And you know, Americans, We've been spoiled for a very, very long time. Amy and I went to Italy for the first time in 2010, and gas prices there were like 250 a liter. Four liters to a gallon. Math whizzes want to figure that out. Ten dollars a gallon in 2010. But here's the thing: electric cars are now becoming very popular. Not only are they good for the environment, but people are choosing electric cars because gas is too high. And I read an article the other day that it seems that the oil producing countries are starting to get the prophetic voice. Oh my God, our high oil prices, gas prices are causing people to go get electric cars. And when they start driving electric cars, that means we are no longer what? Necessary. I have a good friend, Charlie Morgan. You all remember Charlie used to play drums for us years ago. He has a Tesla. It costs him 14 cents a mile to drive his Tesla. Prophetic voices, they're all around. Jesus 
listened to the prophetic voice within himself. He was very clear about who he was. He was very clear about what he was going to do. And he was very clear about how it was all going to end. And even though he knew his death would happen in Jerusalem, he continued to, to fulfill his purpose fearlessly. So when he got word from evidently some sympathetic Pharisees that Herod wanted to kill him, he says, you tell that old fox that I'm over here today healing and casting out demons. I'll be doing it again tomorrow, and then I'll be doing it again the third day. In fact, I'll be continuing to do what I do today and tomorrow and the third day until I fulfill my purpose. I'm not afraid of Herod. I'm right out of here in the open doing what I do. We see that happening in Ukraine right now, don't we? You remember how this invasion was supposed to end in three days? But the Ukrainian people are very clear about who they are. They're very clear about what kind of future they want and need. And they're very clear that they don't want to be an extension of Russia. So they are making incredible sacrifices to fulfill their destiny. It's the irony of President Zelensky and, and Putin. You see Putin in these grand ornate rooms at these tables as long as this, you know, sanctuary. And he's sitting at the end and four people are sitting way down at the other end, all together in a little crowd. You see Zelensky out in his regular clothes in the streets of Kiev in front of the, the parliament doing self-videos saying, I'm here. We're together and we're going to be here to the very end, you see. He's not afraid because he's very clear in his purpose. Jesus said in verse 35, look, your house is left desolate. And being a person who does dream work, I know that the archetype of a house is one's soul. So anytime you're having a dream and you're in a house or you're in a building, that house or that building is representative of your soul. So when I hear your house has left you so desolate. It tells me that people are not listening to the prophetic voices and they're getting burned. I know that years ago, when I was a counselor for those suffering from addiction, they had a six-month residency and then a six-month aftercare. I was the aftercare counselor, and most all the clients we had were from the Department of Corrections. And here's the deal. You've been arrested and put in jail for cells, possession, crimes. But if you go through the jail program, I think at the time it was called Genesis, and you graduate Genesis, then you have an opportunity to do a residential treatment, which gets you out of jail sooner. And then it, your parole is reduced. And so 98% of the guys we got to come see us to help them with their addictions were from the Department of Corrections. And on almost every single case, when they started to realize what recovery was going to cost and how much work it was going to be, they would come to us and say, I know what to do. I don't need any of this crap and this garbage. You don't need to psychoanalyze me. I can do this on my own. And that's when we counselors, as we had worked all together, would say, oh, well, that's interesting. Because your best decision-making skills have brought you to this time in this place. How's that working for you? Sometimes they would move on. Other times they would continue to, to resist. When we don't listen to the prophetic voices, when we don't listen to that voice inside of us to bring us clarity about who we are and what we need to do with our lives, we increase the possibility of getting burned. Now, came across this article the other day and I found it very interesting. Catherine Milkman is a behavioral econ economist with the Wharton School and she thought it was fascinating that people were now ordering groceries online so she did a study to see if there was a difference between people who ordered the groceries to be delivered that day or the next day compared to people who were ordering their groceries three or more days in advance. And what she discovered was this. People who ordered groceries 
to be delivered the same day or the next paid more money, and they bought a whole lot more unhealthy food. People who ordered groceries three or more days in advance tended to spend less money, and they were ordering healthier food. And she broke it down to this, to, to one's um, current self and one's future self. Current self wants something sweet and sugary like Twinkies and something salty, crunchy like chips. I want it now. So current self says, yeah, that's what I want. But that same person, if they allow their future self to say, you know what, there are healthier choices for me. Maybe I should, you know, buy some healthier things because I need to, you know, to be conscious of what I'm putting into my body. So future self seems to be much more rational. So current self says, I want to get out of debt. No, future self says, I want to get out of debt. Current self says, I want to buy a big screen TV with a surround sound system. But if you want to eat healthier, if you want to, to get out of debt, then listen to your future self, make your plan, and stick with it. Along with this article, then there was a quote from Psychology Today. The more certain the future is, the more power it has. So make the future certain. Give it power in your life. Put your future self in charge of your current daily decisions. Jesus looked over Jerusalem and he said, Jerusalem, 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 Jerusalem. Killer of the prophets. Oh, how you have tried to silence those whom God has sent to you to help you to see more clearly who you are and what your future is all about. And all that I, if, I, if you had just allowed it, we would have gathered you as children to, to as closely as a hen does her chicks. But you were not willing. What I see in that passage is this. Listening to our future self is an act of love. Listening to our future self is an act of love. Having a clear image of who our future self is, is an act of love. Several years ago, Dennis Snow, boom, boom, spotlight, zoom. Several years ago, I think, I don't know, maybe 2008, 2009, the Windermere Union Church found itself in need of a, of, of a change, in need of a transition. And so we did a congregational workshop like we're going to have later this month. And then at the end of that workshop, we had four umbrellas. And we called them umbrellas because the structure was there, but it was not a rigid structure. So there was enough room for something to, in, to, in, to, to in, uh, be something to be included in it that we hadn't thought of yet. So one category was spiritual social. And this particular group created social events for our church and also opportunities to, to enhance uh, our faith spiritually and, and different kinds of retreats and such. Then we had congregational care, which was a group of people who were making sure the congregation was being taken care of. And from that evolved Stephen's ministers, which are people who have gone through 50 hours of training on how to listen and how to help people during crisis times in their lives. The next group was technology. When we first moved into this building, we had all kinds of new technology that we had never used before, and we had all kinds of problems with that technology. So we had to learn how to use it. That's when we started recording my sermons and then putting them on YouTube. I've got a lot of sermons out there in the uh, internet world. wonder who's listening. I hadn't heard any of them, so, you know. It's like a friend of mine says, here, take my advice. I never use it. <laughs> and the last group was warm welcome. And that was what we did. There'd be a group of people who make it their intention that every week, everyone who comes into those doors feels welcome to this congregation. And the warm welcome team helped us with new member orientation and receiving new members. That system served us extremely well for a long time until it didn't. 2019, October of 2019, we had another 
church gathering where we came up with four areas. Diversity, being intentional about creating a more diverse congregation. Building, for those of you who are new to us, you see the empty lots on each side of the church. Our master plan is to put a building over there and to put another building over here. This one over here originally was designed to be education building and the one over here would be a rec and a banquet hall so that when we have a church event, we don't have to uproot all the chairs and make it everything happen in this building. And we already started the process at the beginning of 2000, getting an idea how much it was going to cost and getting a scope of what we wanted to build. And the other two were tech and education. And the education part of it, Latrell and I in the spring of 2019 came up with an idea about Windermere University so that one individual or two individuals weren't responsible for teaching every single thing that goes on in the church. We have such a diverse group. An individual can give a one-time workshop or give a month-long workshop or give a whole six, seven weeks workshop. But we're thinking, well, what we can do is offer the congregation options, like a university. And then when COVID hit in March of 2020, that became a necessity. We had to. And not only because we weren't meeting in person, not only did we have people and we had incredible programs and, and, and opportunities to learn, but it also became a way for us to connect to each other because we were no longer seeing each other in person. Then technology, once again, came up. But our dream then had changed, you see. We were wanting to create a technology that would allow us to stream our services live. And when COVID, 2000, when COVID hit in 2020, all of a sudden, technology was no longer something we could explore, but it was something we need right now, and creating virtual worship. And then, as many of you were watching the services at home, you didn't want to watch it on your small phone. You didn't want to watch it on your computer screen, no. The pixels, you know, were fine for a small screen, but you all wanted to watch your service on your big screen. And everything looked blurry. And so we invested in high-definition cameras so you could see it better. And it's amazing how even though we were not intentional about creating that kind of technology and having that kind of capability, the times made it necessary, right? COVID hit we had to change. So our October 2019 gathering and planning became rather prophetic, did it, didn't it? In the Jesus story, the crucifixion is not the end of the story. Jesus moved from the cross to empty tomb, from death to resurrection, and so will we. Our recreating Windermere Union Church is about seeing our future self. We are going to decide what our future self will be, what it will look like, what we are going to do to fulfill our purpose in this world. And remember the quote from Psychology Today, the more certain the future is, the more power it has. So we will listen to the prophetic voice that was within us, we will listen to the prophetic voice that's with us collectively. And we will listen to that voice. And we will trust that voice. And fearlessly move into our future with confidence. And we will discipline ourselves to allow our future self to inform our decisions for today. Thus ends the lesson. Amen.